welcome back to Australian Musician. Ah, oh, it's wonderful to be back and it's great to see you again. <laughs> uh, it's been two years since uh, we saw you last. Um, fill us in. Oh, goodness. What have you been up to? It's been a whirlwind, a lot has happened. Um, I have my own TV show now uh, on CBBS, which is the children's equivalent of the BBC. And uh, it's called Yolanda's Band Jam. So, you know, music education has always been a passion of mine and uh, something that I think that every young person should be able to enjoy music, make music and feel free to do so. And so it's great to have this show. We're in our second season now, third season to come. Uh, live shows as well to go with that. So it's a whole, a whole nother thing that has started up. Uh, and most recently just had a baby. So we've got a six week old who did the 24, 24 hour flight here to Australia. Um, so yeah, it's been really, really good. And lots of broadcasting things in between as well as touring, obviously. <laughs> Uh, when we last spoke, you were talking about uh, going back to record an album. Yes. Uh, what happened with that? So it's still in process. I think the wonderful thing about studio is that you, you go in, you might have a plan, and I definitely had a plan of what the second album would look like. And we got into studio and it's just been morphing and, you know, sounds are creating and growing. Um, so I'm really, we're in the studio now, but it's taking a little bit longer than we first thought. But this year, there is a new album. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I did notice that you did with the kids project was that you played with the Philharmonic Orchestra? Yes, indeed. Yes, I was part of a campaign for BBC's Bring the Noise, which is um, rolling out music education resources to all schools in the UK. And we did this wonderful live broadcast uh, with the BBC Philharmonic to every school in the country. And it was such an amazing sound and sort of mixing that classical sound with a contemporary, um, all genres included. And it was really, really fun. Um, yeah, really, really good to do. What are the quirks of playing uh, with an orchestra as opposed to playing with a, a regular band? I think for the for the player and I guess for the listener, the sound is just that much bigger. You know, I, I had the wonderful pleasure of doing the BBC proms as well. We did the, the CBBS prom and to be able to to perform with that big sound behind you, it just really shakes you to the core. And I think the same for the audience. They just hear the timpani and the strings and, you know, everything comes at them live and direct. And it's a wonderful feeling. You can't beat it, really. How important is it to have uh, for children to have music? In their education. I think it's very, very important. You know, when we think about our memories or we think about good times, sad times, I, I can guarantee most people will be able to put a piece of music or uh, a song that was in the charts at the time that made them feel a certain way. And so I think music is very emotional and it's very educational as well. Um, but I think we also owe it to that younger generation to give them all genres of music, not just something that we think should sound like a children's song <laughs> or just one style of music, be it classical or pop. It should be a bit of everything, learn about cultures, learn about, um, about cultures and where, where the music come from. And actually you then give um, that young person a, a taste of the world, really, which, which is a wonderful thing. What's the number one thing you try and instill in the children? To embrace their own sound, you know, and I think it, it's quite a nerve-wracking thing to try and create music. If you're sitting in silence or you're in a place where you don't know if you're allowed to make a sound, to offer that young person the liberation, say, just bang a drum or just play any note you feel. And at first it feels strange, but then you start to see them be creative and really sort of start to enjoy themselves. And I think we need to allow young people to enjoy making music and, in, and listening to music. Yeah. Uh, you're playing Port Ferry Festival again and yes. other dates around Australia. Uh, what are your memories of Port Ferry Festival? Oh, it was a fantastic time. I definitely remember signing, <laughs> signing CDs and T-shirts for a very, very long time, for hours um, after the show, but it was just so wonderful to meet people. Um, everybody there is so warm, everyone just wants to enjoy themselves and communicate and, and have a good time. Um, we did different concerts along the way, so from performing in the daytime to performing in the evening. And of course the women's uh, morning on the Sunday was just really powerful. So I can't wait to get back there and, and I'm hosting the, the women's morning this time, uh, which is a, an absolute honour. And yeah, it's just such a good atmosphere. Everybody's smiling, everyone's here. We're not going to worry about the rain. <laughs> Um, and, you know, just have a good time and listen to great music. Uh, do you generally like um, festivals as, a, as opposed to a club gig? Um, they're different, uh, but I think uh, overall for me performing is about communicating with an audience. So when you get to meet a festival audience who are there 
ready and waiting and you know they've had something to eat or they've seen another act and they're seeing you um it is a different feeling to sort of a, a club gig where they've bought the tickets it might be date night everybody's a little bit more you know sophisticated uh, so you do get a different feel but actually all in all I just want everybody to to listen to the music and, and take away um, positivity so I guess the crux of it is the same but yeah festival audience are definitely going to be up and, and ready for it <laughs> Talk about your, your gear, and yeah. Your relationship with Yamaha mm. and the, the models that you play, and why you chose them. Uh, I've always played Yamaha saxes from the very, very beginning. Um, I had a Yamaha student saxophone tenor, which is my very first. And at the time, I just knew that I liked the tenor sax. I just loved that, that warm, mellow sound, the lower register. Um, for some reason, I had a very natural subtone, um, which I really loved, and that came through really well. So when it was time to upgrade if you like to my professional saxophone I went we have a wonderful store in London called sax.co.uk and they have every saxophone under one roof it is literally a saxophone heaven you walk in and you hear the angels sing you know <laughs> and I played all brands all types all ranges and still came back to Yamaha I think number one my finger positions naturally went there I, I love the, the feel of it um, but to play Yamaha Customs uh, on all, all my ranges, soprano, alto and tenor, just felt like it was my sound still, um, but just a little bit easier to play, I guess, is, uh, is, is the wonderful thing. And then I can hit all the ranges that, that I want to from altissimo through and still keep my subtone, which I love. <laughs> yeah. um, and what about the mechanics of it, like key action? Is yeah, that important to you? it is important to me. But what I do notice and what I always tell um, sax players is that the saxophone is a working machine, you know, so you always have to take it for its MOT. Uh, even when I first got my saxophone, I still took it to be overhauled and sort of changed the action. I do like um, my pads to be quite close to the hole, so not, not too high. Um, and so you still can change the mechanisms as, as, as you feel fit. So don't necessarily just judge the saxophone on that, because <laughs> it all changes after a while. <laughs> Uh, guitar players have to change guitar strings. Ringing. Right. Uh, what's the sax equivalent? That would be the reed. Um, the reeds are, without a good reed, everything changes really. Once you know you've got your core sound from your horn, then your reed and your mouthpiece are, are your strings, <laughs> really. And uh, I, I think for my tenor, definitely, I, I know I love my mouthpiece and, and my reed setup, but it does always change. Sometimes you, you want to push a bit more in, a, in another direction depending on the music that you're playing. Um, so for me, reed and mouthpiece is a continual cycle of looking, trying, being happy, then unhappy. <laughs> uh, it's a love-hate relationship for sure. <laughs> um, you spoke about uh, being in a music store and trying different saxes. Yes. Uh, how important do you think bricks and mortar music stores are compared to buying something online? Oh so important and it's quite a scary time at the moment because everything is going online and yes you could buy a perfectly good saxophone online and even you could go into a store pick your make and model and order it online but it might still be different you know they are handcrafted instruments after all so from horn to horn same model and make it's still gonna feel different um, so I think it is important to go to a store play the saxophone play it for as long as you need to I went for two whole days of playing straight until I really made the decision and found found my saxophone and it was that particular saxophone I could I don't think and I know for a fact it, it doesn't work because I've played another saxophone tried it out and written down the registration number and then pl played another one same make and model somewhere else and it didn't feel the same so that particular horn is really important and um, my, my biggest sub story uh, was I, I always carry my saxophones onto the aeroplane and put it in the overhead locker. I have a very special case that I know fits in the overhead locker, but every so often you will meet a, a, a check-in assistant that will say, yeah, it has to go in the hold. This has only happened to me twice. And the last time we were flying from Germany back to London, I'd already done the concert, but m me and the band, we were going back to London for a, for a show and they wouldn't let me on the plane. They said I had to check it in. 
and um, so very, very unwillingly checked in my, my beautiful saxophones, all three in one case, and it didn't make it to London. They didn't put it on the plane, but we had to do a show. So I, I love Yamaha, Yamaha look after me very well. I'm a Yamaha artist, and they sent me the exact same make and model of my saxophone. But that show was, it was never felt like it was my voice, <laughs> you know? Um, so your particular horn is, is, is yours, if you like. <laughs> Uh, speaking of music stores, uh, guitarists or young guitarists yeah. get discouraged from playing Smoke on Water or Stairway to Heaven in music stores. <laughs> Is it the same with the uh, girl from Ipanema with sax blades? <laughs> I think, yeah, that and Baker Street. <laughs> but I do have to say, there is a reason why there are some songs that are made for instruments. And if you play a song that you know what it sounds like, you know what it feels like, and you know how you want to feel when you're playing it, which chances are it's going to be a popular track, then you know you found your instrument. So don't let anyone tell you to stop playing Stairway to Heaven. Play along, play along. <laughs> uh, you've got uh, quite an extensive Australian tour coming up. Yes. Um, what happens after that? What's on for the rest of 220? Uh, yes. Things are a little bit different? They are very different, but very exciting. I literally, before getting on the plane to Australia, signed a record deal with uh, Sony Magic Star. Uh, and so we've got an album coming out for the children's festival and then adult music will follow. And it's a very in, in, interesting and exciting time in terms of having visuals and really getting out there, um, doing lots more concerts live for both my adult music and children's. Presenting is, is going great as well. I, I love being in front of the camera now. This is a, a new thing and I'm always used to being on this side of the, of the microphone, but I also now have to interview artists and, um, and carry the show, which is a fantastic thing to do. And to watch my little one grow up. I know I speak about it a lot in this interview, but it's so fresh, she's six weeks old. Um, that it's wonderful that in the job that we do, we can take the family with us and, and be together. So it makes it all possible. <laughs> um. The band that you've got on this yes. tour, tell me about the band. So we've got a similar band to, that we came with last time. We've got Rick Leon James on bass, Talbot Wilson on drums, Dave Niskin on guitar, so they were here before. And then we've got a different keyboardist this time, Ollie Howe, and we've got Zion on vocals uh, to this time as well. We might pick up some horns, some Australian horns, which would be nice, and then you get the full, the full impact. <laughs> uh, and the material you'll be playing this tour? So we've got some of our favourites from Love Politics War, the last album. We're calling this tour the Million Billion Love Tour because, you know, it's all about positivity and trying to look at the, the greater side of our world because there's so many things happening at the moment that sort of are giving us fear and, you know, trepidation. We want people to feel free and, and open. Uh, and we've got some new repertoire as well, which we've been touring in England last year. Uh, so we'll see how the Australian audience like it. <laughs> Elaine Brown, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.